But let's, there's no, nothing for it, but just to kind of start with where we are right now. You know, I wrote the first book about all this 31 years ago now, 1989, um, um, back when I was 27 or 28. And, and ever since then, I've been at work on it. And back then, we were issuing warnings of what was going to happen if we didn't get our act together. And we didn't get our act together. So now we're kind of issuing bulletins from the front line. Let me show you a picture for a minute of um, the trip. I think we could even turn the light down a tiny bit so you can see a little better. Trip that I organized uh, to Greenland uh, last couple of years ago, um, 18 months ago. And Greenland, you know, is one of the most beautiful places on the whole planet. Uh, in our hemisphere, it's the great storehouse of ice. The ice sheet's enormous. It covers what's the biggest island on Earth. Uh, most of it's like a mile thick. Uh, it's really astonishing. And it's melting. Um, that's why we were there. Um, I, I don't know if you can really see this picture or not. This is the boat that I organized for the expedition. You can see out the front, there's lots of water as far as you can see, but I was standing behind the pilot, um, and there's the, looking up at the electronic chart, and there's the cursor that marks the boat, and it was clearly about a mile onto solid land, so I pointed this out with mild trepidation to the captain, and uh, <laughs> the captain said, not to worry, the chart's five years old. Back then, everything here was frozen as far as you can see, but more. You guys know this story too well because you know what's happening in the Gulf of Maine and just how fast it's heating up and just how fast the fish are fleeing north and you know on and on and on. Well same thing all over. The reason that I went there was I want to take the young woman in the grass skirt on the left up there. She's a poet, another poet, a friend of mine named Kathy Jetnil Kajiner. A wonderful poet who's done great readings at the UN and General Assembly and things. She comes from the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific, which is another one of the most beautiful places on Earth. People have been there for several thousand years, quite happily, thank you. Um, 20th century didn't go perfectly because we exploded the big bomb at Bikini Atoll, so one whole part of the archipelago is still radioactive, you can't go near it. 21st century is going somewhat worse because the highest point in the Marshall Islands is about a meter above sea level, which is a poor place to be on a rapidly warming planet. So I think it would be good to have her deliver one of her poems standing on the ice that when it melted would drown her home. And she recruited the other woman, a young Greenlandic native, uh, Nidaka Nibiana, uh, whose homeland is just disappearing beneath her feet. And so they did it, it was really great. They did a fantastic job. Millions of people have seen it on YouTube. Uh, uh, I recommend it to you. Um, it's filled with a certain amount of rage, but also a certain amount of generosity, at least at the understanding that we're all in this same boat eventually. Eventually. The iron law of climate change is the people it hits first and hardest are the people who did the least to cause it. So that's worth bearing in mind all the time. But everywhere, eventually. Now, this I took from my cell phone um, in the front seat of the helicopter as we were leaving. We've been changing the batteries on some of these instruments that scientists use to record the recision of the glaciers. It takes a minute to get to the good part, so I'll just uh, talk about it. Um, Look, climate change is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. Um, by far. So far, we've raised temperature of the Earth a degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like that much when you say it that way. But think about the kind of other ways to denominate um, that change. The extra heat that we trap every day near the surface of the Earth because of the CO2 we poured into the atmosphere that's the equivalent of the heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs a day. And that's a lot of heat, and that's why more than half of the summer sea ice in the Arctic is gone, and that's why all the other things that we see around us are taking place. Um, um, that ocean, like all oceans, is about 30% more acidic than it was 40 years ago because it's absorbing carbon. This is the edge, the tongue of one of these myriad glaciers, 
And it's about 120 feet high, so a 12-story building, which actually is higher than anything in the county where I live. But uh, we just happened to be going over, keep an eye on this piece at the end here, uh, when part of it let go. And these, you know, these waves were 50, 60, 70 feet high, so the pilot was kind of in a hurry to get the heck out of there. But I encouraged him just to circle once, um, partly because it was incredibly beautiful, even if in a kind of eerie way. I mean, this is an unbelievably beautiful planet that we live on. And, and even in its turmoil now, and convulsions in a sense, it's incredibly beautiful. But also, I just wanted, at least for me, maybe for you, this kind of visceral reminder of what's happening every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day, someplace on the planet. You know, and every time it does, the ocean rises some fraction of a millimeter, and the world changes. We've raised temperature one degree. That's caused all that ice to melt. That screwed up the world's hydrological cycle in a profound way, as you know, Warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That's why in arid areas we get more evaporation and more drought. And that's why we get scenes like the scenes we saw in Australia over New Year. Um, I've spent a lot of time, I just yesterday on the phone with 350 Australia crew for quite a while. I've spent a lot of time talking to people there. And people are seriously messed up. Like that was so hard and so painful and so big, they think 20% of the forest across the Australian continent burned. And it didn't just burn, I mean, it charred. It burned so hot that there's nothing, nothing left. Um, um, people described going into the forest in the immediate aftermath, and the main sound you could hear was animals howling in pain. We think five, six, seven species went extinct in real time over the course of a few weeks, you know, as everybody watched. Um, once that water vapor is evaporated up in the atmosphere, it comes down. That's why we get the kind of gully washing storms that are about 70% more common in the northeast U.S. than they were uh, 50 years ago. Um, that's what happens with the one degree increase in temperature. On our current trajectory, even if we kept all the promises that we made at Paris, uh, which one nation, the nation that put the most carbon in the atmosphere of any other nation, has decided it will not keep. There's a lot of shameful things that have happened in the last four years. It's fairly difficult to top that, it seems to me, for uh, shame, though, we're making a daily effort. Um, <laughs> um, 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 if we kept the promises we made in Paris, the temperature would still go up about three degrees Celsius, a little more, uh, even if we did that, which we're not. Um, three degrees is way, way too much. It won't be three times worse than what's happening now. It will be many, many times worse than that because change is now coming exponentially, not linearly, because we're passing this long series of tipping points, um, which are scarier all the time. There was a big story, big study in Nature yesterday uh, saying that team of scientists that had been tracking 300,000 separate trees in the rainforest for the last 30 years have determined that increasingly they're no longer soaking up carbon, they're now giving it off. They've gone from being a sink to a source, as the scientists would say. It is truly scary. We cannot let that happen. Our job is somehow to figure out, not how to stop global warming, it is too late for that, how to slow it down enough that it doesn't completely overwhelm civilization and everything that we have. Um, um, and we don't know for sure that we can still do that. We think that we still have a window, a narrow window, a closing window to do that. The world scientists told us in October of 2018 that if we wanted to meet the Paris climate targets or even come close, then by 2030, we would need a fundamental transformation of the Earth's energy systems, which they define as cutting carbon emissions about in half. That's a big task. 
to get to by 2030. And since um, we didn't do anything for the first two years, we've gone from 12 to 10, and, and we've got to move, and we've got to move very fast. So that's the bad news, and I'll try not to give you much more bad news. Good news is that in a way we didn't 30 years ago, even a decade ago, we kind of know what we need to do and how we're going to do it. I mean, the engineers have done their job with enormous power. Uh, the price of the solar panel, the price of the wind turbines dropped something like 90% over the last decade. That's incredible. That's the gift that gives us some route forward, some way to make change at the scale and the pace that physics would require. Um, and you got the sense just from looking at the sponsors of the people for this event, how many of them are doing things like putting up passive homes, putting up solar panels, learning how to do this work. It's not impossible by any means. It's not even that expensive. Uh, I was, we had Mark Jacobson, the great Stanford researcher, Skyping in last night as I was doing a program, and he was giving the numbers and explaining that we can do this for less money than it would take to keep expanding the fossil fuel system to meet the needs that it would do the energy system from 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. So given that we have a huge crisis and given that we have a solution, the interesting question is why aren't we doing it? at full speed. Why isn't this the main task to which humans are now devoting themselves? Why aren't we applying ourselves the way that we did say during the last existential crisis that humans faced in the last century when it was fascism in Europe, you know? And people had to go across the Atlantic and either kill people or get killed in order to deal with it. We don't have to do that. We're a somewhat easier set of challenges, but we're not needing that set of challenges. We're not doing what we need to do. The question is why? Took me way too long to figure it out. I wrote that book, um, The End of Nature, all those years, and for maybe a decade or so afterwards, I just kept writing more books and giving talks and writing papers, because my assumption was that we were in an argument, and that the way you win an argument was to pile up more data and reason and evidence, and eventually our leaders do the right thing, on and on and on, and it took me too long to figure out how much I had miscalculated. Um, eventually, it dawned on me that we had long since won the argument. By the mid-1990s, the world scientists were in firm, robust consensus about what was going on. We won the argument, we were just losing the fight because the fight wasn't actually about evidence and reason and data. The fight was what fights are always about, which is money and power. And the other side in this fight, the fossil fuel industry, had so much money and so much power that they were able to win the fight even as they lost the argument. Um, they were clearly willing, in an effort to keep their business model going for another decade, two or three, to break the planet. That sounds hyperbolic. I wouldn't have said it that way even five years ago because I don't like to exaggerate. But great investigative reporting over the last little while, five years or so, has made it abundantly clear that these guys knew everything there was to know about climate change back when I did in the 1980s. You know, Exxon was the biggest company in the world. They had great scientists. Their product was carbon. Of course they were going to study it, and they did. And the scientists told their executives exactly what was going to go on. In fact, last year, people unearthed this chart that had been floating around Exxon in those days that predicted with uncanny accuracy what the temperature and the CO2 concentration were going to be in 2020. The scientists told the executives, and the executives believed them. Exxon started building every drill rig they built to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was in the offing. Okay? What they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. Instead, they went and hired many of the same people, the whole fossil fuel industry, went and hired many of the same kind of PR types who used to work for the tobacco industry. And they did precisely the same thing for fossil fuel that they'd done for tobacco, try to spread as much doubt as possible about what was going on. 
um, they started in on this 30-year completely phony debate about whether or not global warming was real. A debate both sides knew the answer to when the debate began, it's just one of them was willing to lie. And it was probably the most consequential lie in human history because it cost us 30 years that we desperately needed. 30 years ago, there were actually a lot of small things we could have done that would have made a huge difference. A modest tax on carbon 30 years ago would have steered the kind of super tanker that is our economy a few degrees off course, and 30 years later, we'd be sailing into a different ocean, you know? But we didn't do that. At the behest of the fossil fuel industry, we not only went dead ahead, we went much faster than we did before. Human beings have produced more CO2 since 1988, 1989, than all of human history before then. So now we're in a tough place. And now we're in the place where we have to figure out how to build power in order to fight that power that remains in the fossil fuel industry. We can't do it with money. They're always going to have more money. But we can do it in other ways, and that's what we've been trying to do. I'm going to show you just a few pictures from the early days of the uh, climate uh, uh, movement. And in a way, these are for you just to kind of see, what, you know, get a sense of where this came from. And for the rest of you, just to kind of see who your brothers and sisters are. When we started 350.org a little more than a decade ago, there really wasn't much of a climate movement. Um, and it, we seemed an unlikely group of people to supply it. It was myself and seven undergraduates at Middlebury over in Vermont. Um, and we had no money and we had no idea what we were doing. You can tell from listening to me, as compared to all the other people who spoke, that I'm not a kind of orator or an activist or anything by, you know, uh, I mean, that's, I'm a writer. Um, writers almost by nature are introverts. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, but <laughs> I'd really rather be home in my room typing, I must say. Um, um, but you know, new occasions teach new duties, so you know, uh, uh, on we go. And, and there were seven undergraduates, and there were seven continents, so each one took one, and we set out to organize the world. The guy who got the Antarctic also had to do the internet. So um, uh, our first day, of, we tried to 2009 to tell people, let's just have a day where we get everybody around the world to at least talk about this for the first time, really to kind of draw some notice to it. And, and we didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, the internet was just at the stage where it was sort of possible to kind of imagine the first of these sort of distributed days of action, but no one had ever really tried one. So, you know, we got the first sense that might it was going to work. Um, uh, we told Ray to do it on a Saturday, but on a Thursday our phone rang and it was our leader in Ethiopia who, like all of us, was a volunteer, like most of us was a she, like many of us was, you know, 17 years old. Um, Greta Thunberg was not the beginning of the youth climate movement. Youth have been leading this fight for a long time. Greta's unbelievable. She's become a friend and I really like her. She's as great in person as she is from a distance. But the really good news is there are 10,000 Gretas scattered all over the world, and it's been a real pleasure to get to know them. I spent, uh, I, I spent a fair amount of October writing college recommendations for people I think of as sort of close colleagues, you know, that I, I work with, which is kind of odd, but there you are. Um, at any rate, the phone rang, and it's our leader in Ethiopia, and she's in tears, and she says, the government's taken away our permit for Saturday, so we're doing this today before they can stop us. And that was brave, because the government wasn't particularly nice about it. But that wasn't why she was crying. She kept saying, we want to do this the same day as everybody else. We want to be part of this global thing. We don't want to spoil it for people. We're really sorry. And we've got 10,000 kids right now out in Addis Ababa <laughs> chanting 350. So we were like, well, do not worry about it. Your date's not a problem. You've done good. And she had done good, and it sort of kicked off the beginning of this. Over the next 48 hours, there were 5,200 actions in 181 countries around the world. CNN called it the most widespread day of political activity. They were not all big. It was so moving in September when there were 7 million people out in the streets to see something like the same number of actions, but this time instead of 100 people at each one, there were 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever else, so it's grown and grown and grown. But even at the beginning, the thing that was most obvious and that I really want you just to see as I flip through a ton of these, um, uh, 
Um, I've always been told that environmentalism was something that rich white people did. And if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist, and on and on and on. And it took about 10 minutes of watching these pictures flood in on Flickr to realize that that was nonsense. That almost everybody we were working with around the world was poor and black and brown and Asian and young. Because that's what almost everybody around the world is, okay? And oddly enough, they're exactly as interested in the future as anybody else, maybe more so, because the future is better than ours. So people brought their A-game, you know, their wit and their, uh, 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 um, this is, you know, the religious community for the first time got really involved. There's the head of Muslim South Africa and indigenous traditions, and behind them the Anglican Archbishop, the big multi-faith march, and China, and there's your brothers and sisters in the Maldives, that's the Student Government Association holding their meeting in a lagoon to demonstrate the existential problem that comes from living close to the ocean, and on and on and on. And you know, yes, there were a number of pictures that ended up in a file marked 350 adorable. And they were adorable, but they were also hard to look at because, you know, those girls are going to be refugees. And not from anything they did, from stuff that we did. So, you know, on we've got, we think we've organized about 20,000 demonstrations in every country in the world except North Korea. Um, and it's been really fun and really beautiful. And we've done these giant art projects that were so big we needed to borrow a satellite. That's a, and there's dry, now dry riverbeds in the southwest when the satellite came over, like 3,000 people just put blue blankets overhead for a sec to bring the river back to life. It was great. And we just keep doing this kind of educational work. If we had 50 years to deal with this, this is what we do, because this is the way humans change best, you know, slowly and gradually and through education and so on and so forth. And I wish we did, but obviously we don't. Uh, we had 30 years and we we didn't use it. So now we're again the wall. And so now we have to match education with confrontation. These are scenes from nine years ago, at the start of really that confrontation phase of the climate movement. And the Keystone Pipeline was the first place where really people told us when we started that there was not the slightest chance because, uh, you know, the oil industry had never been beaten about anything. Um, um, and then more people went to jail than had gone to jail about anything in this country for a very long time. And by the time we were done, it had become a kind of single environmental issue. And eventually, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people surrounding the White House and so on, eventually President Obama said, okay, we won't do it. Um, Donald Trump, of course, said the first day in office that we were going to do it, uh, and signed a piece of paper. And he's apparently convinced that, that he actually did do it because he keeps insisting that he did. Um, don't tell him, but it's still not built. Um, and there's still a lot of people in the way. Um, the good news about that, it's not just that there's 800,000 barrels a day of the dirtiest oil on earth in the ground every day. The really good news is everybody walked it and just said, okay, we're going to fight everything else too. Every pipeline, every frack well, every LNG terminal, everything we can find, we're going to fight. Nothing gets built without a fight. We win a fair number of these. Look at the work people did in Maine, down in South Portland, stopping that yeah. pipeline. That we're going to come through. Um, we win a fair number of them. Um, um, in fact, a lot. Just in the last couple of weeks, you know, the Constitution gas pipeline on the East Coast got blocked. The, uh, uh, the, what would have been the biggest tar sands mine up there in Alberta, the Tech Frontier mine, they pulled away and said investors aren't having it anymore. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago in the UK, a uh, uh, court ruled that they couldn't build a big new third runway at Heathrow Airport um, because they signed the Paris Climate Accords and this didn't make any sense anymore, the court said. So, you know, we win a lot of these and even when we lose, we win because we slow them down for a while. And every month that we slow them down, the engineers back in the lab are making a solar panel another percent or two cheaper, and the spreadsheet gets worse, and you know, on and on it goes. So, so we fight, we fight. We don't know if we've got going in time or not, because there's tons and tons of 
trouble all over the world. These are a few pictures from a day we did a few years ago where we just asked people who were already feeling the effects of climate change to kind of weigh in. And they were, you know, amazing. And those people in Siberia, well, we now have forest fires three, four, five degrees of latitude north where they ever been before. Um, you know, those are people leaving their homes in Micronesia. The water in a high tide just sloshes through the living room now. Uh, those are people in the part of Pakistan that in 2010 had the biggest flood since Noah, the kind of flood you can only have on a warmed planet. Uh, rained so much, the Indus River swelled to a point where it covered about a quarter of the country and 20 million people were out of their homes. So in essence, everybody from like Boston to Baltimore having to evacuate. And when you look at them, it's pretty clear that they were not causing the problem from which they are suffering, okay? This is always the sort of just brute injustice of it, so key. So, you know, we keep trying new things. The year after the, we started the pipeline stuff, we started this work around divestment. Um, um, because, well, because we needed to figure out how to get at the oil companies. Um, I show you this picture partly because of where it's from. Lake K in Haiti is on that southwest peninsula. Um, the year after this picture was taken, they had the worst hurricane they've ever had. So it wiped out 80% of the buildings in that town. I don't know if those kids are still alive. We've tried hard to find out, but Haiti's not an easy place to kind of track people down. Um, um, so that's one reason it resonates. The other is what those signs say. Your actions affect me. Um, which is true. I mean, they never had a hurricane that big. But hurricanes draw their power from the heat in the first few meters of the sea's surface. You make it hotter, you get a bigger hurricane. Um, and your actions affect me, but not vice versa. There's nothing really that they can do, save appeal to, they're not gonna use less fossil fuel, they don't use any now. They're not gonna march on the White House because we don't let Haitians into the country, certainly not for that. Um, um, they're not going to divest their stocks and bonds in Exxon because there's more, you know, wealth in this room tonight than there is in that whole province of Haiti. You know, um, um, that's why we've got to do it. And again, when we started the divestment thing, we had no idea if it would work. Um, our inspiration was the similar campaign that had been run around apartheid a generation before. And in fact, Desmond Tutu had asked us to kind of take this up on the theory that climate change, as he said, was the human rights challenge of our time. Um, we didn't know if it would work. It started small. The very first institution in the world to divest its holdings from coal and oil and gas was Unity College in Unity, Maine. <laughs> A theater in Portland where we were doing this do the math tour when the president of the college stood up to say that and we just cheered like crazy. Now we're at the point where it's the largest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at 12 trillion dollars in endowments and portfolios that have divested. It's doing its job to one degree or another. Shell Oil last year called it a material risk to their business. Which is good because Shell Oil is a material risk to the planet. Yeah. Um, did you ever see on TV this kind of manic fellow, uh, stock picking guy, Jim Cramer? Um, he comes on the TV and tells you which stocks to buy, and he's very, very big following. Well, three weeks ago, he went on a long rant about how you should, no one should buy oil and gas stocks anymore. You can't make money on them anymore because this divestment thing has spread everywhere. Everywhere they're doing it. And you can't even go, okay, okay, that's okay. So it's good, and we're working them hard and it's causing them trouble. We've got to speed it up. And one of the things we've realized, of course, is that if you're a company like Exxon, you'll fight to the last bridge because the only thing you know how to do in the world is dig things up and burn them. If you watch their commercials, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Exxon was like an algae company that happened to have a couple of oil wells kind of left over. But in fact, 98% of their uh, capital expenditure still goes to what it always went for. Okay. So they're going to fight to the last bridge. So we're also going after what we think is the somewhat softer target now. 
of the financial financial institutions that give them the money to do what they do. Okay, um, we're calling it SockTheMoneyPipeline.com, and it's a, like a coalition of all the environmental groups in the country. And then, and uh, Anne was talking about it. April 23rd, second day, the middle day of this three-day commemorative. So first day, Earth Day, we're all going to march, we're all going to commemorate Earth Day and think about what good people did to get things going and what we need to do and so on. And then the day after, we're going to start in on the next 50 years of this problem, okay, this crisis. And we're going to start by going after the money. And the biggest target that day, where we need your help, is a bank called J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay? Uh, they're the biggest bank in the world, and they're the biggest fossil fuel lender by far. They've lent, since the Paris Climate Accords, $196 billion to the fossil fuel industry. They're the biggest lender by far for every bad thing you can think of, every pipeline across uh, Indian country, every, uh, you know, um, deep sea drilling, tar sands, on and on and on, that's them. Why are they the biggest? I just wrote another piece for Rolling Stone that came out online last week called the Doomsday Bank. And it turns out that one of the answers to that question of why they're especially irresponsible, even compared to the other banks, which are all doing their best to be irresponsible, must be said, but <laughs> the best at it is Chase. And why? Well, so the guy who was, the guy who was CEO of Exxon in the 80s and 90s and kind of invented corporate climate denial, the guy right at the moment when they knew what was going on, but they, he, you know, that guy, when he retired from Exxon, his retirement job was to become chair of the board at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about Climate, all everybody's causes climate change. Look, this guy is the Bond villain there, you know, sitting there stroking the cap while the you know, <laughs> world explodes around him. It's crazy, and we need your help. That's why I got arrested in D.C. We were in the lobby of the Chase Bank, um, um, uh, just very peacefully and happily sitting there. Um, uh, Jane Fonda and uh, Joaquin. We're on the outside of the glass looking in and waving, which was very nice. And, um, <laughs> um, 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 and we were trying to make the point. And the point's getting heard. BlackRock, the biggest financial institution in the world, a few weeks ago their CEO, after a lot of pressure from this same campaign, said he issued a letter saying, from now on, everything we do is going to be with climate in mind. It's clearly going to have to change the financial system here. Now, we don't know whether they're going to live up to their word or not. Everybody's watching closely to see. But it's a sign that people are getting through. And, you know, I mean, we're going to keep working our political system, pulling the political lever as hard as we can. That's why I'm headed off in a few minutes to go do what I can for the junior senator from my state. And, you know, so on and so forth. Um, it is kind of funny that he's the junior senator. <laughs> um, 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 but even in the best of cases, you know, our political system's pretty rusted and dysfunctional, and the idea that it's going to just overnight become spry and uh, well-oiled seems to me a little bit wishful thinking. So we're also going to pull the one other lever in the world, not just the political lever, but the financial one. And in certain ways, it's easier lever to pull, or maybe a more useful one, because A, these things happen fast when they happen. You know, when the CEO of BlackRock made that announcement, people in every stock market around the world knew it within minutes and were reacting to it, okay? And it happens globally all at once. We can change Washington, but Washington, pretty much thank heaven, doesn't really rule the world anymore quite the way it used to. But Wall Street sort of kind of still does. So it's a place where we can really dig in. You know? um, you'd be surprised how many of you have Chase credit cards in your wallet. <laughs> if you've got an Amazon card or a United Airlines card, yeah, you know, it's, it probably comes from Chase. And the good news is, every single one of you who has a chase card in your wallet also has a pair of scissors in your kitchen drawer. Um, 
April 23rd, we're going to be doing a lot of cutting, um, and, 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 and it's going to be good. I, I've talked on too long. Let me just show you a couple more images here. These are all pictures of the resistance everywhere now. It's beautiful to see that resistance in every corner of the world, um, you know, in ways we couldn't have imagined even a few years ago. Here's pictures from the climate strikes. I was in New York with Greta down on the Battery. Um, and it was, you know, 250,000 people down there, and it couldn't have been more fun. And the same thing going on uh, literally all over the world, everywhere you can think of there. That's <laughs> what I want to uh, I'm trying to go back here. Come on. All right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Now you're going the wrong way. There we go. We're getting close to Norway. Some, depending on your point of reference, you know, this is the Israelites and Pharaoh. Um, this is the Rebel Alliance and the Death Star. You know? <laughs> Go on one more. Once you start seeing those images, you see them everywhere. That was a couple years ago in Seattle Harbor. That 40-story thing on the right is the drill rig that Shell contracted with to go up and start opening the Arctic up to oil drilling. Think about that for a minute. We told them, if you keep doing this, the Arctic's going to melt. They kept doing it. The Arctic melted. They did not say, maybe we should go into the passive house business now instead. No, they said, now that it's melted, we could drill for more oil. That would be easy. Um, that calls into question whether the big brain was really a very good adaptation or not, it seems to me. But happily, there were tons of people with good brains attached to better hearts that got in the way. These are our colleagues at 350 Seattle out in the water. We, of course, call them kayaktivists. Um, um, and for a week, they kept that thing in port. Now, eventually, the Coast Guard very proud of it. Eventually, the Coast Guard broke them out, you know, and they managed to get their true rig out. By then, the damage had been done. You know, I got a call from the Netherlands from the executive saying, look, we're throwing in the towel because it's too much brand damage. You know, it just people, this sort of David and Goliath thing, would you put it to an end, please, because we're stopping. We spent $9 billion on this, but we're out of the arc. So it was a big win, a really big win. <laughs> And we need a lot more of those good wins, and we need them fast. And that's why we need you to do something on April 23rd. Um, we need people to be, uh, the only way to say it is the planet's outside its comfort zone, so we need you outside yours. Um, and I don't know what that means for everybody. You know, uh, it's, you know, we need different things for different people. Um, I definitely did not think, I mean, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher. It did not occur to me that I was going to be going to jail with some regularity uh, at this <laughs> stage in my life, but there you are. And i got to say, there may be people here for whom that might be a useful thing um, um, to do. I wrote the letter that asked people to come to get a Washington and get arrested and start that key something, and it was a hard letter to write. Um, one of the things I said in it was, I did not think young people should have to be the cannon fodder for that particular part of this. You know, young people are doing most of the leading. You've seen that, you've seen it here tonight. Um, young people are doing most of the leading. But if you're, you know, 19, uh, much less 13, it's possible that an arrest record is not the very best thing for your resume. <laughs> One of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do? It was with some pleasure that we watched people with hairlines like mine descend on D.C. We did not ask them when they were getting arrested, how old are you, because that would be rude. But we did, with a certain cleverness, I think, say, who was president when you were
were born. <laughs> the two biggest groups are from the FDR and the Truman administrations. On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. He was old enough that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was long enough ago I'd truthfully forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Um, um, it was good for the young people there to see their elders acting the way we actually need elders acting in our society. So it was good. Um, I would like to tell you that if we did all this, we were definitely going to win. And I can't do that. Um, obviously, we're not going to stop global warming. As I said, that's no longer on the menu. We're not even completely sure we can stop it short of that three degrees or whatever. There's a huge amount of physical momentum in this system. It's not a good sign that the Arctic is melted. It's not a good sign that the trees in the Amazon are now emitting more carbon than they're soaking up, you know, on and on and on. There's a lot of physical momentum, but we have a chance. We have a narrow window and it's closing. I can't guarantee we're going to win, but I can guarantee you, because I've been showing you pictures all night, that we're going to fight. It's the most important fight probably that humans have ever or will ever get the chance to engage in. And it's definitely the fight of our time. And it's sort of a burden to have to take it on, but it's also kind of a privilege to get to, to get to be in the kind of positions where we have some leverage, where we can do something, where we're near enough to the centers of money and power and things to be able to make some kind of impact if we do it all enough together. Um, so all I can tell you is there's people, you, know, you guys have important work to do over the next couple of days, and I'm so grateful to you all for doing it. It's powerful, let me be a part of this. Um, there's people meeting in rooms like this all over the planet tonight and every night trying to figure out how to do this. And it's always an honor to be in those rooms, and it's a huge honor to get to be in this one and just to say that it'll be good to just get to fight this shoulder to shoulder with you all. Thank you very much.